The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to start with a special meeting. Um, but first, we have to um, take a roll call. McCoy? Here. Welch? Here. Smith? Here. Smith? Here. Lyerly? Here. Mills? Here. Leighton and Warren? Here. Becker? Here. Okay, all seven board members are present. Um, Andrew Becker's um, going to be attending tonight remotely. Um, we're also joined by our interim superintendent, Vicki Beyer, and members of her cabinet. And we're going to start with um, our action items and uh, under action items, we've got employment of staff. Would someone um, read the motion? I move that the employment of staff for the 2022-23 school year as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Kinsey? Are we going to be doing a voice count? Or are we um, vote? Or are we going to um, do it online? Online voting is now open. Oh, okay. Oh, there it is. I got mine. The motion carried. All votes were in favor of the motion. Thank you. We'll move on to number two, transfer of staff. I move that the transfer of all, I'm sorry. I move that the transfer of staff for the 2022-2023 school year as presented be approved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, Kinsey, go ahead. Online voting is now open. The motion carried with all in favor. Thank you. Moving on to C, parking lot bid. I move that the Northeast Asphalt be awarded the bid for parking lot replacement at Edison Middle School in the amount of $256,410.50 as presented be approved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, Kinsey? Online voting is now open. The motion carried with all in favor. Thank you. Moving on to D, roof replacement bid. I move that Vanda Hay Refined Roofing LLC be awarded the bid for roof replacement work at Red Smith in the amount of $456,500 as presented be approved. Second. Discussion. 
Hearing none, Kinsey. Online voting is now open. The motion carried with all in favor. Thank you. Um, e is the election of secretary of board of education. So um, we don't have a motion here. I'll just make one. Um, I move that we elect Kinsey Lear as secretary to the board of education. Anyone want to second me? Second. Second. Okay. Um, should we do a online vote on that as well? Okay. <laughs> McCoy? Aye. Welch? Aye. Smith? Aye. Lyerly? Aye. Mills? Aye. Leighton and Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. The motion carries with all in favor. It's official. There's no backing out now. <laughs> okay, that completes the work of the special meeting, a special board meeting. Um, uh, I guess I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, all in favor? Uh, we, well, we are adjourned. <laughs> We're going to move right into our um, into our regular work session. Uh, let's see here. Is it, is it a separate Zoom meeting? Yes. Yes, Andrew. We're going to have to. You'll have to get in and out or out and then back in again. I okay. believe. All right. Okay, we're live. Um, okay, well, so we're I back. Don't see, um, I don't see the boardroom. Is that? Like I hear you, I but I see just the logo instead of the boardroom. Hmm. I'm not sure. Andrew, normally you would facilitate the education on all the items under yeah. education, but yeah. um, should we forego that this time? Because it will be pretty hard to do that with when you're not in the room. Um. I, I wasn't. I wasn't too worried about it, but if if, you wanna, someone... if you want to attempt it, that's just fine. I just wanted to give you an out if you didn't want to. <laughs> that's no, I, that's okay. I think so. Okay. My only thing would be, um, and I guess it would be no more difficult for me than anyone else to keep track of um, to keep track of the um, who might be coming in from from outside. So okay, uh, I'll try it. We'll see how All it right. goes. Yeah, we'll 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 just take it slow and steady. Okay. Sure. All right, um, we're back and every, I think everyone is accounted for finally. So we're going to start with, we are live, right? Okay. Um, we're going to start with, uh, we don't have, I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I have to officially call the meeting to order, sorry. Um, and then uh, we've already done roll call. Everyone's in attendance and um, I think we'll start then with uh, the next would be open forum. Do we have anyone? Nope, no one's called in, no one's up. Um, up. Okay, so no, nobody uh, wants to speak at our open forum. So we're gonna move on to operations, which will be um, facilitated by Don Smith. Okay, we have two items on the operations agenda today. The first one is the RFP for the superintendent search. I believe um, we have somebody from HR presenting for that. That's correct. We have Lori Myron joining virtually and Jake Elverson is here as well. Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. All right, great. So um, we want to uh, put out an RFP for an executive search firm for the superintendent. Um, I will just review the document with you. I think you all have a copy of it as well, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So really starting on page four with the objective, because the other information is just background information for the district. So obviously the objective of this is to enter into a contract with a qualified company to provide this executive search for the position of superintendent 
um, commencing uh, July 1 of 2023. Um, it's anticipated that this will be in a contract awarded to one vendor, not multiple. The RFP is designed to provide interesting, interested offers with sufficient basic information to submit proposals meeting minimum requirements, but is not intended to limit a proposal's content or exclude any relevant or essential data. Offerers are at liberty and encouraged to expand upon the, specific, the specifications uh, to evidence their service capability under the agreement with the district will not be liable for any cost proposals that may incur in preparation or presentation of that proposal. Um, and obviously we reserve the right to reject any or all proposals or to waive any formality or technicalities in the proposals in the best interest of the district. The RFP is not construed as an offer nor as a contract or promise to do business. There's no binding obligation or business relationship that commences or exists between the district and any company or bidder unless and until a final written contract is executed by both parties with the approval of the board. All terms and conditions of the selected company's business relationship with the district shall be set forth in the written contract with the district. Then below there, that is a tentative schedule. So tonight, obviously reviewing it, uh, the 27th is when the board will actually vote and would approve that. The 20, um, the, on August 10th um, is when the proposals are due September 26th, the selected vendor will do their oral presentations. October 10th, the Board of Education would select a vendor. October 24th, the board would contract um, the authorization approval. And November 1st is when the contract would start. Any questions about that so far? All right, not hearing anything, I'll just continue. So uh, down on page five, the scope of services the responsibility of the selected executive search firm would include the following items. And there are a number of items there listed. There's 16 items. Um, do you want me to read all of these? Have you, I don't know if you've had a chance to read these. I, I don't think you need to read them. Okay. So if there's not any questions on those, and then it talks about the deliverables, deliverables expected also. And there are 11 items there. Are there any questions on those? Okay, hearing none, I'll just continue then. Yep. Um, page seven, it talks about the scope. So the uh, experience and the submission guidelines and what the expectations are for the companies that want to submit their information to us. So again, it goes through all the detail of what they have in there. One thing I will add that has been um, or mentioned that has been added since the last RFP is item number 10. So based on experience with our previous search firm, we've added this that says that Number 10 is a complete list of formal and informal partnerships, relationships, contracts, and services with educational vendors or vendors providing services to educational agencies. Ongoing relationships should be listed first, followed by prior relationship, relationships held within the past five years and the reasons why those partnerships were terminated. Any questions on any of that? Nope, I think we're good. All right, and then uh, and bottom of page nine just talks about the scorecard and the decision scorecard for that and the criteria that is used and lists a number of different points and then how those points are calculated and how those are weighted based on points. Um, so really the next steps are once it is approved, then uh, Jake will send that out. There are, I believe Jake can confirm, but I believe it's seven firms uh, directly being sent to and then also publicly noticed as well. Andrew has a question, I think. Um, yes, um, I am wondering, so with cost of services being 25 points, could you theoretically have a situation where you have a, a, a good and very competent search firm with good experience successfully placing superintendents um, lose to one that's maybe a little bit better, but costs much more given that only 25% is on costs. I mean, we want someone good, but I, I get a little, little nervous when I see only 25 points for costs out of a uh, hundred. Yeah, my, this is how it was the first time around. The points haven't changed that structure. My assumption would be that the board would still choose the most qualified firm 
in order to produce a candidate that would be the most successful. Okay, so the points are the points don't bind us to to picking that that one. I can just speak from my own opinion on that because it's really will be a board decision. But my opinion would be that the other things that are also equally like the next two, that the 25 and 30 points, those weigh heavier. And granted, some of that as you evaluate the different vendors may have subjectivity with that. But then I think some of those would be weighted heavier than others. And so still, unless somebody comes in that's five times, let's say, what somebody else is at and they can produce and have proof of the same outcome. I think it's just being fiscally responsible, but at the same time, not, um, I would assume that we would not go with the cheapest one just because it's the cheapest, but because the other factors were being met. Sure, I could just see some, uh, my concern would be, uh, does someone come in costing, you know, double and lose a bunch of cost points, but then because they're a little bit better on their completeness of proposal and a little bit better with a few more placements and a few more of this and a few more of that, you know, could it beat someone if the, if the costs were double? I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I just want to make sure it's not, uh, doesn't force our hand, you know, if someone, and I'm not talking about 10%, if someone else can prove that they can do better work, I'm talking about, you know, double. So, okay, thank you. Brian does has a question. Well, did Jake, did you want to add anything to that? No, I was just going to say, we plan to make a best value decision, right? So we'll evaluate all the proposals and the intent is to bring in the best two or three vendors to, uh, to do all presentations to the board. And to your question, Andrew, I mean, if, if one vendor is very good and is charging 30,000 and another vendor is excellent, but is charging 50,000, then at that point we make a best value decision. Is it worth paying premium of 20,000 to get excellent versus paying 30,000 and getting very good. And that's a decision the board will ultimately make. Thanks, Brian. Um, regarding bullet point three with experience and successfully placing superintendents um, who stay three or more years, um, I'm kind of concerned that that's five points more than the other two decisions on there, especially if they've successfully placed someone who's been there for two years and is still planning on staying, just kind of how that works out on there. Um, but I've never gone through this. So if that's not a huge point, that's fine too. Well, we're certainly open to changing the, the weighted values of each of those factors. So if the board decides that, you know, more, perhaps that extra five points should be shifted to cost, then, then we're happy to do that. You, you guys tell us how you'd like it and, and we'll make the adjustment. James. Yeah, I, I would be more interested in understanding the rationale as, how you, as to how you distributed the points within each category, right? Because the weighting I can get behind, but I don't understand that how you score, what the distribution of points will be, given your example of 50,000 versus 30,000. Uh, typically, when I participated in RFPs, it's very granular um, point structure. So each one gives you five or six points. So at the end, I feel very uncomfortable being presented a score and then during a debate, overriding that score, right? So as the committee evaluates this, if they could provide that rationale so I don't have to take a decision in a few moments of discussion, to override a, a quantitative evaluation of the responses, uh, I would appreciate that support. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're saying. So, so the weight values that we <clears throat> use are the same weight values we used three years ago, which were established with uh, the former superintendent and the uh, chief human resource officer at the time. What, what specifically is your question about the, the weight values that we're currently using? So given seven participating vendors, yep. when you give someone a 30 point value, is it relative to the scoring of all the other vendors or do you earn points up as you evaluate specifics of their, um, their proposals? So I just need to know the rationale of how you're making the decision to give someone full weighted 30 points and another vendor, 24 points. Because you know, if you if you come in 
you know, ten thousand dollars lower. But if that's a very small proportion of the difference between uh, the scores, I just need to understand how someone earned full versus half versus you know twenty five percentile within that category. So right. I understand. So, yeah. Yeah, so I get your question now. Sorry about that. It's completely subjective with the exception of cost, right? So cost, the lowest price proposal will get the full 25 points allocated. And then in descending order, the next lowest will get a percentage of that based on the difference between the lowest cost and their cost. And it will keep flowing down like that. For the remainder of the evaluation factors, it's going to be subjective based upon the evaluation team's review of experience and affirmative action and where they're at geographically. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's just subjective. Subjective, each individual on that committee provides their subjective score. Right, so, so, the, so the plan would be for us to, so the, for the evaluation team to individually score the proposals and then come together as a team and discuss how each of them came up with those scores for everything with the exception of cost. And then you talk through it and say, okay, well, I see you came up with 23 out of 25 and you came with 24 out of 25 or 18 out of 25, and then try and find a middle ground for where there's consensus for why each of us scored it the way we scored it. And then present it to the board and say, based on the team's evaluation, we think that these two or these three vendors are the highest rated vendors, and then we bring them in for all presentations. And then the scores at that point would be out the window based on what the board thought was the best presentation based on how much it's going to cost, right? So we're going to say to you, well, two of the seven we think are exceptional. They're going to provide oral presentations. You'll listen to those, and you might say at the end of that, these guys are essentially equal. Both of them have got phenomenal experience. So then you're, what the discriminated them will be price. But you might have both of them come in, and you'll say, well, look, these guys are clearly better than the other guy. They're $5,000 more, but it's worth paying the premium because of the level of experience or, or whatever it is that differentiate the two. So I'd warn that going into a committee discussion like that over an RFP where you're going to render a quantitative evaluation, Andrew's um, concern is valid because you have set up a situation where within a 30 point structure, your distribution of points would be very differently than what you use in cost, right? Because it, what I'm hearing you say is, Everyone scores, and then within each category, you kind of figure out and reconcile within each category. So your definition of superlatives versus average within the 30-point score may not be enough to offset a very low bid, but moderate in other um, categories. So I just, I, I have the same concern that Andrew does. So, so let me ask you this then. Are you suggesting we should assign greater weight to cost or less weight to cost? No, I, I'm suggesting that in advance of people providing their personal evaluation, that you kind of create a, a rubric where people understand the definitions of, I find this vendor to be a superlative in this category, that equals X number of points, and then go down and create some guidance for them in each category so that each category renders the same kind of distribution of points so that we can avoid what Andrew and I now are concerned with, where um, a poorly designed conversation in one uh, provides an opportunity for a low bid, poor vendor to win a quantitative evaluation for us to then have to go in and reverse your decision through a 20 minute conversation at the board. I'm wondering that's what I'm trying to avoid. I'm wondering, would this be helpful? So for the two, the second and the third one, where there are you know significant weight value on that, could there be additional criteria that was determined in advance? Yes. That detailed out, this is what this means. So for instance, um, the second one talks about the completeness. Well, define completeness, right? Completeness Correct. means what? And so that would be, what is that? So it defines completeness if they do the following things. And then those following things each get so many points so that it makes it more objective versus subjective. And then in the third point, um, again, if it's if it says three or more gets 30 points, then maybe if it's two, it gets how many? And so define that in advance. So there's not so much subjectivity. Is that what you're asking? 100%. Every effort should be taken for the quantitative score. 
the quantitative score to represent the committee's suggestion. Yes. Brian? Oh, Laura. I realize this is from the search um, a few years ago, but I wonder if some of these things have changed. One of the, a couple of the things that stick out to me are the geographic availability of consultants in the Midwest. I think if anything we've learned over the last couple of years is that so much can be done virtually. Um, and if that's, I mean, it's five points, but if that's something that's that's in there, if that's something that um, that really should be included. The other thing is having a consultant with a commitment to affirmative action. How How is that measurable? And I think if we have DEI as an important part of our district, is that more important than for somebody to just say they have a commitment to it? And so I wonder if the evaluation criteria could maybe be tweaked a little bit rather than just using what was used a few years ago. And in addition to adding the components that James and um, Andrew had mentioned. Lori, do you have any thoughts on that? I agree. I think that would be, it would be nice to have uh, points two, three, and four, especially since, well, four is only five points, but the other ones that are higher points that that is, um, and the cost is the cost, but I think two and three for sure can have more detail and we can work on some additional um, criteria that would actually define that better to make it less subjective and more objective. Laura, what are you, so what are you thinking around the commitment to affirmative action? I mean, how would you make them measurable, I guess? Can you make that measurable? I, that's what you're suggesting, right? Is that's really a, how do you measure that? How do we make that measurable? Well, I think if, if we're the one with experience in successfully placing superintendents in school districts, how many superintendents of color have you placed? And I think when, when we look at expanding it beyond the Midwest, um, there's certainly gonna be more opportunities. So um, I think one of the questions I had not necessarily related to this um, specifically, but just about um, why we would ex hire an external firm. But going along with that, I can get to that, but going along with that, those things considered, I wouldn't wanna make sure that we are ensuring that the evaluation criteria um, is measurable. And, and like that, how many have you placed? Um, I think we all know you can say you're, there's a commitment, but there has to be some action behind it. So you would like to see that same, like James had requested, that same build out of that bullet point around commitment um, to affirmative action. You would like to see that defined what that means. Okay. I think on that um, point, we could ask for specific data, right? So data would yep. be the proof would be in the numbers. So anytime you can gather data that keeps it very objective. So the other, the other point then was the geographic availability of consultants in the Midwest area. I don't know, what are people's thoughts on that? Brian? Yeah, that was the same topic I was going to mention was the commitment to affirmative action, I think should have more points than geographic availability and at least be equal to the quality of references on there. So I would be, there's, there's no magic number saying that it has to add up to a hundred on this. So um look at increasing the commitment to affirmative action to at least 10 points um so at least it matches with quality of references and it kind of will shift that balance a little bit with the uh, availability of consultants in the midwest area i think i think we should look at consultants that might not be in the midwest area which might help us out more on there so i mean this is it's a five point scoring right out of 100 you're proposing 105 points um, it's five points out of that. So you could have consultants outside of the Midwest who would put a proposal and knock down the price in order to fall within that range. I, do we feel that geographic availability of consultants in the Midwest is that worth five points? Is that important? I, Lori, do you have thoughts? I, I guess that we, when we did this, right, this was, we, we weren't doing virtual meetings back then. It's a different world than it was um, when we were searching for the last superintendent. So I guess, is, is this truly worth five points on that, on that scoring? I know when I've done RFPs in the past um, for high level positions, it's actually been more of a nationwide search um, because the relocation costs are the same or close to it, right? So um, I'm not sure if the board would want a superintendent that is remote 
to run a district of our size, um, but I don't know if that's no. what you're inferring. No, this is just this is for the consultant, right? right? This is the geographic availability of consultants in the Midwest. So I guess I'm wondering, do we need a do we need a consulting firm that has somebody that's a, I'm assuming that so that they are able to be on site? Is that important to us? Brian? I think that the expenses that the consultant will have will just kind of naturally winnow that down that if they're based out of California, the expenses are gonna be higher for them and that's gonna kind of reflect in their proposal for us. So I would be very comfortable with striking that bullet point altogether of the geographic availability of consultants in the Midwest area. I think it'll, the, it'll just kind of work out as it goes through, so. So what you're proposing, what we're talking about is um, bumping up the commitment to affirmative action to 10 points and eliminating geographic availability of consultants in the Midwest. Yes. Yeah. Does anybody have a concern with that? I don't have a concern. I just want to make a point real quick. Just, just so everyone knows, when cost proposals were submitted three years ago for this same requirement, uh, the, the bids came in as a fixed cost plus travel, right? So it's, it's a bit vague how much your ultimate cost is going to be because you might pay 25000 for the consulting services and then if they are coming from California, as somebody mentioned, then you could have, I don't know, 15,000 or 20,000 travel expenses, vice a company that's coming out of Chicago, and you might have 2,000 travel expenses. But you're adding those travel expenses onto the total cost for- well, no, because you don't know the travel expenses at the front end. Um, right? you know, I guess I was thinking that they do it all remote. <laughs> I was thinking, I, I guess, you know, working with, I, in my job, I'm working with a consulting company um, for an ERP implementation. And five years ago, we had to bring contractors on site to do that work. And now we're doing it 100% remote. We're not paying any travel costs because those consultants aren't coming here. I guess that's what I was thinking when we talked about geographic availability. Laura, what were you thinking? Um, going back to this, uh, going through this process a couple of years ago, um, it feels like a really long time ago. And Andrew, maybe you can jump in here too. Um, we did have people come and meet us in person and it, it was a good, um, uh, I think that's a, it's a good process to go through to have them come and do their presentation in person. You get a better feel for what their company um, is capable of and, you, and, and the process is long, right? Once you choose a company, um, there's there's quite a few steps along the way, so you we will be working fairly intimately with these people, and um, and so the so having, I mean whether or not they want to bring in um, have a lot of additional costs, uh, that will factor into how much you know how much we're spending on this search. So there's a reason why the 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 um, that bullet point is there. Um, I think. Uh, people have learned along the way, having done this a number of times, that um, it is there's a certain understanding. I think uh, if your if your company is from the more from the Midwest about what we might be looking for in our community for a superintendent, that's just my opinion and my take on this. And Andrew, you you've been through this process a number of times. Can you add anything to that, or please feel free to contradict me if you think I'm wrong. Uh, I guess I think, you know, for the amount of time that we're, we're spending on this, I, you know, we'll, uh, I, I think we can speak up if we think someone important didn't miss the, you know, miss the cut unexpectedly, but there are probably, there are probably a few firms, I think, that clearly can do a national search. And I, I think the I think it's likely to be a, a pretty easy cut between you know, the top few and the not top few. So I'm not, that's why I'm not too worried about it. I, I tend I tend to agree with what Brian said about the points, but I, I would be very surprised if we have a bunch of tightly bunched. And I would think any close, any close calls, we would just want to err on the side of more presentations if there's not a clear, a clear division. That would be, I guess that would be my take. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference um, probably my, my concern about the, the cost points too, was more, more theoretical. I don't think people are going to be coming in, you know, triple or quadruple anyways. 
And, you know, so that, that's where I'm at. I'm not, I don't think some small changes in the points are likely to affect the who will get. Lori. I was just going to say before, I, just for clarification, I thought someone said before with everything being remote, maybe the superintendent could be. So that's why I made that comment. I was like, well, that would be an interesting uh, <laughs> role. But um, the other part about the geographic availability, I, I think, um, I always think it's important to go and see. And so I think for the consultant to be able to see if they aren't familiar with Green Bay in the area in order to be able to talk to a potential candidate to really understand and know this area, it would be helpful for them to come and see the district, see the building, see the community, everything else. So that's why I'm guessing that that was an important feature. And then Mary, I just wanted to, you know, you popped on before if you wanted to add something. Yeah, my experience has been that they come and run the stakeholder groups because you don't want to bias the stakeholder groups. And to run a stakeholder group, I really think they should be on site um, versus virtual. And my other experience has been, um, I worked most recently with a firm that was in another state, probably about six states away. I don't want to say the firm, but um, they did have local representatives in Wisconsin. They typically hire retired superintendents um, that have that level of experience. So it, it's not unusual to have those Midwest or even closer uh, reps. And they would probably present that in their proposal to you. So I was just gonna share that much what Mary shared, which is um, when we went through the process uh, last time, um, not only did um, they have the meetings with the board, but they also then met with parent groups. We brought in certain uh, business groups. Um, so they were here quite a bit for that. And they're also here when we have, um, they, when they come for the interview with the board, the last firm set it up so that they also then, there was a community and information session. And so they were here for that as well. So just, I guess, as you're thinking about frequency of travel, Right, I would say there were quite a few times that they were actually here at the district office. Okay, so based on that, do we wanna keep the geographic availability at five points? I would be in favor of that, but I'm, you know, it's possible that other people feel differently. Right. There's some time to discuss here. I mean, that's part of why we do this two weeks in advance of the the vote too to see if any more thoughts come up. So I guess I don't see what what we would gain from additional discussion here. I don't think there's a, I, I wouldn't I would feel a strong need to to direct a change, but I don't feel a strong need to say absolutely I feel great and I'm certain this is the way I want to vote for it on uh, in two weeks either. Laura, I was just going to say this is not a, a a huge deal breaker or anything for me. I think Laura and Andrew have been through this before, so. I would be okay with that. The only thing I, I think I'm a little, um, you know, if this is something just to consider is if, because I, when I, when we had went through this the process the last time as a district, I was the, on the parent advisory committee. So we got to provide feedback to the, to the firm. And so I also wonder how much of that has changed. I mean, I remember distinctly a lot of the things that were mentioned in our group. And of course we had the pandemic since then, but I also wonder that how many of the needs have really changed in terms of wanting some more representation for people of color and different things in the district that are still some of the same concerns aside from the pandemic. So um, the amount of time and data and cost that is for a consultant to come in and do that, and if it was just two years ago or three years ago, just something to consider if that's something that would actually have to be done again to have to have those community and parent focus groups done again. But this is not a deal breaker for me by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, does anybody have anything else? Um, I just have one more thing. And I know that um, I, I, I believe Laura, you, you mentioned this earlier too. Um, the, there's, um, I, I think some people who have never been through this process before might wonder why we can't just do this internally uh, this process internally. Why do we hire a consulting firm to do this? Um, I, I hope that some of this conversation shows kind of the, the rather large scope of the work takes place over a number of months um, so that at the end you can you can say that you you know you've done a very thorough search. Um, uh, Lori, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about 
that uh, why why this this um, this work is not done internally, um, and uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so whether it's a superintendent or a CEO of a large corporation, um, all my experience has been that it is always outsourced to a specialist that does specifically this type of recruiting and uh, selection, so that it's completely independent and that you do have unbiased. Um, and keeping it very objective so that they can go out. This is their specialty. This is what they do. Um, it is a great deal of time and that it also keeps it really objective. So, so to my way of thinking, um, you know, if you had this done internally, uh, the, the, people, the people doing the work would be choosing their own boss. And um, in some ways that, that, that's a conflict. So, um, Anyway, that I know that I've I've had a number of people kind of ask me that, right? Um, can't we just do that in house? But um, there's sound, solid reasons why um, it's not done that way. And um, so, anyway, this is the process we've chosen, and um, this is kind of the first step. Ryan, uh, in regards to the process with this, if there, if we wanted to make a change to this. Um, just changing the points, would we do that at our next meeting or would we propose it now and have it changed for the next meeting? I mean, the, the bolt would be at the next meeting. But we would propose the change now. So you're talking about upping the, the, um, the, D, the DEI piece. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. Um, yeah. Would I make that as a motion? And Vote on it, or oh. that be out of order. No motion. So are we good with? I'm sorry. No, we're good with having um, them make the change and up the commitment to affirmative action to ten points. I'm I'm agree with that. Okay. Anyone? Yeah. Everyone yeah. else? Okay. Andrew, are you good with that? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. Laura? One more point for clarification. Talking about um, the district doing the superintendent search versus an outside firm, isn't the school board ultimately makes the decision on who is hired? So therefore, HR is not determining who their boss would be. The school board would be determining who their boss is. So it's, is it really more of an issue of the huge amount of time that would take away from the regular HR processes? It's, certainly the time is a big part of it too, but having people internally be part of the process as well, like, like Lori said, um, you know, would open the, the process up to bias or, you know, so anyway, even though the board ultimately is the, is the, um, the, the body that votes on the on the choice so okay brian i would also like to just confirm that we'll leave the uh, geographic availability of consultants in at five points then yes the only change we are asking for to be brought to our regular board meeting is um adding that additional five points to the commitment to affirmative action are we good so no, anything they Sorry, you're good, Lori. You have what you need from us. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and then the last agenda item for operations is the um, preliminary budget. We have um, Angie Robley, our chief financial officer, and Sarah Noah, the executive director of finance, here to share that preliminary budget book with us. Good evening. I'm Angie Robley, Chief Financial Officer for the District, and I have Sarah Noel with me, our Executive Director of Finance. For those of you who are new to the table, 
Um, she's been with the district for a little less than a year. Um, so coming up on a year in September. So we're grateful to have her as a part of our team. She oversees all of the accounting and payroll functions of the district. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. To the new ones. Thank you. <laughs> So purpose of the meeting tonight. So why are we here tonight? So we're here to present to you for the first time a 22-23 preliminary budget. So why, right? So why now? So I think, you know, other districts do this. Um, Green Bay has never done this. And I think that it's really important for transparency. Um, we are facing many challenges as a district. Um, including declining enrollment, inflation, um, ESSER funding, one-time funds that are, um, you know, that are going to be used for operations of the district. And I think it's really important for the board to see that document before we come and present in October. So um, it's a shortened version of the budget book. Um, some, some things that are in there you'll, you'll you know, be familiar with, and then other things are, are added for, for this preliminary budget discussion. So, um, it's preliminary, again, based on estimates estimates and assumptions that we'll, we'll walk you through tonight. Um, things will change from now until October, um, but this is a snapshot. It's, um, you know, the best, the best guess as to where we're headed for the next couple of years and into 22-23. So we will be back in October. We'll present um, a full budget book. You'll certify uh, mill rate. Um, you'll adopt that budget in October, but this is just to give you um, a preview a sneak preview of what's coming. So that's why we're here tonight. Uh, so as Angie said, and we're going to continue to stress that this is a preliminary budget for the 22-23 fiscal year. <clears throat> if you want, you can pull up the budget book that was attached to the agenda, um, because we'll reference that a few times throughout the presentation. Um, so tonight we're gonna be discussing uh, how we're building the budget. Uh, including the budget cycle and some challenges that we're facing as a district, um, as well as assumptions that we've used and how we've balanced the budget. Um, in addition, we'll touch on district funds and the tax mill rate. And then finally, we'll present an overview of funds 10 and 27, which are the largest funds in the district. Oh, I'm running the slideshow too. <laughs> um, so in this page, uh, it shows our budget cycle planning calendar. Um, you can see we work on the budget throughout the entire year, as well as uh, other things that we do in closing the fiscal year uh, after June 30th and the daily accounting and finance tasks. Um, you can see that the budget process begins in November uh, with forecast modeling and finishes with the approval of the final budget and tax levy by the Board of Education in October. So, um so now you can, uh, if you're on page eight, so to discuss some of the challenges that we faced um, for the 22-23 upcoming year, we're headed into the second biennial um, or second year of the biennial budget. We know that we did not receive any revenues from the state for this upcoming year. So we're pretty solid on what we'll be receiving um, and know what our revenue numbers are gonna look like. So we still face um, you know, the aftermath of the pandemic um, we are uncertain of funds for the future. So again, we're not quite sure what the state will do, obviously, um, in the next biennial budget. Um, we're using one-time ESSER funds and creating a cliff for the district. Um, and then also, you know, whether that's going to be sustainable or not. Our operational costs are increasing. For example, utilities, we've seen those um, skyrocket for 22-23 um, in our estimates, as well as transportation. So those are some examples. Um, we continue to face declining enrollments in 1617. So declining enrollment, less students equals less revenue for the district to spend on our students. And then the staffing costs. So it's a delicate balance, right, to be able to retain and recruit employees, but on the other end, be able to sustain it and to afford it as a district. Um, so these are, these are the challenges that a lot of districts are facing, not just Green Bay. We're not alone. So I'm going to take your attention to um, the graph that's up there. So the January membership versus FTE. So if we focus on the red line, that is our total employee FTE over the course of the last 10 years. Um, and then the blue bars are representing our January student membership count. So as you can see, you can see the decline, like I spoke of since 1617. Um, and ideally, the total employee FTE line, we would like that to also be kind of following that trend. And we are, we're, we're heading in the wrong direction, essentially. So the gap 
that you see there in 21-22, that is, you know, a major source of why we're facing a fiscal cliff and, you know, facing our structural deficit in the next couple of years. Um, so uh, as a district, you know, this is one of the challenges that we'll be tackling together um, and, you know, and, and taking that into consideration as we um, continue to work through these next couple of years with ESSER funds. As with building any budget, there were some assumptions. Nancy has a question quick. So when you talk about um, the membership, the, like the students and then the teachers in that, okay, who is all in the teacher in that? Are all administrators in there or is it just teachers? And that's everybody, yes. Yep, that's all FTE for the district, yes. So there were some some assumptions uh, required as there are to build any budget. Um, and those included for this budget uh, that staffing levels and uh, building department budgets would remain flat for 22-23. Uh, student enrollment count uh, will continue to decline as Angie was uh, speaking about since the high in 2016-2017. Uh, we've estimated an 8% increase in property values on average. Uh, for vouchers, we're estimating $9. million, uh, which is an increase of $1.2 million over the previous fiscal year. Um, similarly, with equalized aid, we're estimating $183.8 million, which is an increase of $10.4 million over the previous fiscal year. Uh, as you are aware, the board approved a 4.7% increase plus steps for the uh, district staff. Um, the board also approved a 2.43% overall increase in health insurance and a 0.94% overall increase in dental insurance rates and uh, the revenue limit uh, from the state, as everybody I'm sure knows, there was no increase. <clears throat> we are presenting a balanced budget for 22-23, uh, but that's because there's approximately $18 million in ESSER funds being used to fill the budget deficit. Uh, as you know, ESSER monies are one-time monies that need to be spent by September of 2024. Uh, on the graph that's on this page, we also show projections for 2023-24 and 24-25. As you can see in 23-24, we're including another $32.6 million in ESSER funding to cover the projected deficit. Uh, we have strategically saved our ESSER funding as a district because we knew these deficits were coming and we knew we needed to cover them for the next two years. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 24-25, ESSER funding will be exhausted and therefore we are projecting a deficit of $36 million. Uh, the goal is to significantly reduce that deficit in the next two years while we have the ESSER funding to cover the deficits in those current years. So looking at the graph, um, you show a decline in fund 10 revenue, 23, 24, but then it goes up in 24-25, is that based on assumptions of increased funding from the state in the next biennium? Is Yes, so in our forecasting model, we did use $100 per pupil increase. So that's why you see a little bit of an increase there in 24-25. So in the, in the forecasting model, that's what we're using, a minimal increase. Is that because we can't imagine that the state isn't going to bump that number up after two years of not. And that's a pretty modest amount actually after two years of zero. Yes, it is. So we're being we're being conservative because of what happened this year. Um, so yes, so I, I'd rather be conservative conservative sitting in this seat than not. So yep, yeah, so that's why we use the hundred dollars per student. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, regarding the vouchers and the increase in the um, loss of revenue for the district on that. Is that an increase in number of students or is that an increase in the amount that per student is being taken? And do you have the number of students that are, or could you get us the number of students that are um, voucher students in the Green Bay School District? Yes, I don't have that number um, right off the top of my head, Brian, but I definitely will give, I'll actually give you a history of what those, those numbers are. I do have a graph of that. Um, the amount has not increased, but the number of students has increased. So that's why we are projecting another 1.2 million or what did, yeah, 1.2 million increase for vouchers. Cause that's kind of the trend that we've been seeing over the past few years. Any 
Any other questions? Okay. So if, if you turn to page 10 um, in your booklet or, or take a look at that, this is just an overview of all the district funds that are included um, with the Green Bay School District budget. So we are focusing on Fund 10 and Fund 27, which is our operating account and special education because those are by far our largest funds not meaning that any of these are unimportant. Um, we will just cover these in more detail in October when we come, when we come back to the board uh, with the finalized budget. And if you've got any questions in regards to any of the others, please, please reach out. So as you are all aware, um, we've been having many discussions surrounding um, the referendum that is coming up in, in the fall, uh, in November. So we are planning um, to seek approval for a $92.6 million capital referendum in November. We have paid off that debt from the 2016-17 referendum over the past few years. Strategically, we've done that. We have saved millions of dollars for the taxpayers, and now we have created an opportunity for the district um, to go back out to address our capital needs and to refill a little bit of that debt. With that being said, when you look at the graph, I have two highlighted amounts, one in green and one in yellow. So the one in green is showing what we're proposing for a mill rate, which is $8.24. This is the lowest mill rate that the district has seen since at least 1984. I couldn't, I couldn't find any more history, but that's quite a few years. So that's pretty significant. And that's with the passing of the referendum. Um, if, if the referendum would fail, we would drop to $4.76 for the mill rate. But keep in mind, when we come back to you in October, you will be voting on two proposed mill rates this year because we won't know the results of the referendum until November. So that will be a new process for me. Um, I've been with the district for 11 years and we haven't done this because generally we go, go in April. So, um, you know, two resolutions, not a big deal, but we'll be, we'll, you'll be voting and certifying two mill rates based on, um, you know, and then it depends on what happens with the referendum. You can click through. So now we can focus on fund 10 revenues. So if you, if you, um, in your book, you're on page 12. So fund 10 revenues, we're proposing $297 million in fund 10 this year. Um, it's very apparent we are a heavily aided district. So 62% of our funds come from equalized aid and then the other from our tax, our taxes, um, about 80% of our budget. The rest is from, you know, federal grants, and other things, miscellaneous student fees of those nature, but really it's um, the revenue limit, which is made up of equalized aid and, and the tax taxes. When we focus on fund 10 expenditures, again, you know, a huge portion is our, is our employees. Salaries and benefits make up a majority of those expenditures. Another um, topic that always comes to play is the contracted services, which does have a pretty big piece of the pie, but included in there, um, are the open enrollment students out, which is our resident students that go to other districts, which equals about $18 million. We have our vouchers are in there. So the what Sarah had talked about before, $9.8 million is included in that contracted services amount. And then also our transportation costs, which is significant as well at about 7 million. So that makes up about 80% of that 18% for contracted services. And then another um, piece of the pie, the operating transfer out. So the 11% um, equates to about $33 million. That's what we transfer out to Fund 27 or our special education fund um, every, you know, or predicted to be in 22, 23. So that pretty much makes up our Fund 10 expenditures. Uh, moving on to Fund 27, you could go to page 19 if you'd like. Um, total revenues in Fund 27 are estimated at $54 million for 22-23. Um, the majority of that comes from that Fund 10 transfer that Angie just spoke about, $33 million, um, which is 61.03% of the revenues in Fund 27. Uh, in addition, there is um, a majority, the other majority of the money comes from state aid, which is 26.07%. Um, the reimbursement rate from the state is down to 29% at this time. On page 21 are the Fund 27 expenditures, um, which because it's a balanced budget are also $54 million. 
um, of that 92% is uh, accounted for in wages and benefits. So just wrapping, wrapping this up, um, threw a lot at you. Um, but you know, really, I think it's just important to review. Um, keep in mind that when you're looking at the details of this preliminary budget, we're basing that 22 column on budget because we don't have actuals. But when you see the, the final budget book in October, those will be actuals because we'll be wrapping up um, the audit this over the summer. So um, there's a little difference there. So it, and then in that 22 budget column, we'll come to the board again in August for the budget transfers to be approved. We came back in February for, you know, through July through December for budget transfers. So those numbers are a little bit different than what are in the October, the October booklet, just in case you're trying to compare numbers, they are a little different because things are changing all the time. Um, you know, preliminary, nothing is set in stone. There are many, many things that will change from here until October. Um, as you are all aware, right? There's always moving pieces, but this is a good snapshot, a good estimate. Um, you know, our forecasting model. This is where this is where we've landed. Of course, as we, you know, work through reductions, that deficit in 24-25 will be reduced. Um, we don't know what the state is going to do. Obviously, I'm not a mind reader. I wish I was. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got specific questions. Um, Brian, I'll get back to you. Um, I'll, I'll re respond to the board and I'll just give you the history of what our vouchers um, look like since they since they started. Any questions? I just want to thank you too. I know that this this presentation represents um, weeks and months of work and uh, and that you know these numbers um, are kind of scary. And uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of interesting work ahead of us as this as our district works through this. Um, and um, I just wanted to thank you. So. Thank you. And a shout out to Josh Patrick as well. He also like pulls together some of these numbers, and also um, Lori Blakesley and her team. They make it look pretty for me. I don't do that. <laughs> well, thank you both for coming. And that concludes the operations. Um, portion of the budget, or sorry, agenda. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay, um, we're moving on to uh, for education. Andrew, are you ready I'm, to go? Well, having just um, having seen the kind of what it takes to follow the try to follow the boardroom and and presentations I'm, I'm open to if someone else is willing to facilitate I'm, I'm open to that if no one wants to I'll wing it but I could see where it might be hard to call on catch everyone call on people in, in that format I, I understand it's it's not optimal but um, I uh, can do it um, Don Smith's gonna step in is that okay with you Andrew sure I'm fine with that that'd be great thank you Don Alrighty, so then our first agenda item um, under education is gonna be cybersecurity awareness, Vicki. Yeah, thank you. And we are joined virtually tonight by the Executive Director of Technology, Amy Sturks. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Amy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, I am going to try to, oh, I'm just gonna share my screen. Do you all have the packet in front of you of the proposal? We do. It was attached in board docs. Perfect. Okay. So um, the district started really ramping up cybersecurity awareness back in 2014. Um, and the first page and a half of that proposal just shares historic information of what we've done for both our students and majority our staff. Um, currently, as we know it, we have seen more school districts throughout the nation and specifically here in Wisconsin come under cyber attacks. And on the bottom of page two, I would highly encourage you to read the quotes that were given to us from three um, school districts throughout the state. So how um, an incident could occur in our district, it's going to possibly happen in or could happen um, in one of two ways. It's going to be something that my team is not doing. We're not updating our systems. We're not doing patches um, to, to keep our systems safe. 
but an, an incident could also occur through something that our end users do or don't do, right? If they click on a link, they share information, um, most likely not in a malicious way, but that could happen. So we've taken this proposal, oh, thank you, Kinsey, um, to our admins, all levels, GBA, cabinet level, and now here to you to gain support on bringing forward cybersecurity awareness training to our staff next year. So Kinsey, if you could scroll for me down to page three, InfoSec has three, I'm sorry, yes, three opportunities for us to go through trainings. So there's this need to know series, which is very animated. It's fun, um, short little video clips. A second option that they have for us is just the facts. That is a very just factual, here's what you need to know. And then the last series, can see if you scroll down to the top of page four, is um, worked and that's very much like little miniature clips of the office. So what we would like to do is share with you an example year. So Kinsey, if you scroll down for me a little bit further, you can see that the sections of training are broken up into segments. So monthly or every couple months and each segment includes video trainings and assessment and a possible phishing simulation. And again, this is an example year, but the videos are roughly three to five minutes. So within every two to three months, staff would be asked to watch roughly 13 minutes of videos. And that 13 minutes includes an assessment. The phishing simulations that you see, I don't personally believe that we should be phishing our staff um, as often as it's shown here in this example year. Um, I think that we would just have our staff thinking every email is a bad email. We don't want that. Uh, but we would need to do at least one um, at the beginning of the year and then sometime throughout the year to measure our success of this program. So I have gotten positive feedback and support from all of the groups that I've brought this forward to so far. I've had some really good questions that I've had the opportunity to answer. So I just wanted to bring the same same spiel here to you to see if the board has any suggestions or um, questions about what this might look like next year for our staff. Anybody have anything? Nancy? Could you share some of the questions that they had for you or your other groups? Yeah. Um, GBA just wanted to know if the last topic that's listed in this example year, if we went with this example year that we would take that last topic and bring it to the front. Um, they said that they have lots of questions uh, regarding the content of like the laws around data privacy. So that, that was an easy, absolutely, we could do that. And then our, I don't remember if it was the cabinet or if it was our admins that had, I think it was cabinet, that had a question of what does this mean for our hourly staff? And when that was brought back to the admins, the admins didn't have any concern with that. A lot of them would like to take the trainings and instead of having staff do them independently by themselves, take two or three minutes at the beginning of an all staff meeting, show the training video, check that off everybody's list and then continue on. So that wasn't a concern, but a, a good question. Those were the two main things. Otherwise, we've had some positive feedback. We've done trainings like this in the past that have not been, um, they've been very voluntary. And the staff that have gone through those voluntary trainings have said, hey, this is great knowledge because it's not only good for me at my work life, but it's good in my personal life. And I can take this back and share this with my son or daughter who just went off to college or my parents. Um, so we've gotten some good feedback. Anything else? Is All right. I think Andrew has a question. Oh, sorry, I can't see him. Andrew? Hey, um, yes, I, you know, I work in IT and I, you know, definitely concur that we need to be, we need to be doing these things. People, um, you know, I'm not, I, I agree with not so many times in a year, but 
you know, have those, have those fishing tests. People, um, uh, I bet, you know, somebody in this room who even clicked on their company's fishing, fishing test. Um, it's, it's easy to do. And it's, it's, you know, no one makes it, it's not a big, like, um, coming down on you thing. It just takes you to a video and be aware. And, um, you know, this, fortunately, the good guys sent this one and just little, little things that people aren't aware. You know, people who are a bit aware of fishing might say, oh, I'm going to reply and, you know, tell these people off, or I'm going to reply and say, get away from me. But then of course, your, your replying, your reply indicates that it's a real, it is a valid email address when they spammed out to fake. So these are all the, all little things that in a few minutes we can be uh, teaching people and the consequences for something that seems minor, you know, I've certainly in my professional life have had to help deal with the, with the aftermath of when, um, you know, a perfectly innocent action um, led to, uh, led to people having a really bad time. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Amy, for sharing with us. Thank you. Donna, I'd like to request a motion to change the order of the agenda to allow some of our team to present and then head out. Okay, second. So we have a motion to change the order of the agenda. Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> and James is gonna second the motion, so. Thank you. Thank you. Then the request is to have um, move D and E under A, please. Okay. Alrighty. So then that would make the next um, the next agenda item the posting of the standards. Yes, and this will be an easy one. I um, I mistakenly added it to the June agenda because we were so anxious to get that to you, but it's not uh, statutorily required until July. <laughs> Is it warning? Okay. Everyone just hold. Tornado warning. Do we want to um, temporarily adjourn? Yeah, Melissa. What do we need to do? Okay. Okay. So we're going to um, adjourn temporarily while we go to the basement. Due to, oh, I, I need uh, um, sec. All right. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. But we have harsh right. weather heading our way. Okay. No. No one. No one leaving. Or you're going to the basement, right? Right. That's right, okay. Andrew. So sorry. Yep. So hold, just hold tight. Yes. Can we have a motion to reconvene, please? So, although, so we'll wait one second because the alarms are going off again. <laughs> okay. All righty. Can we have a motion to reconvene, please? Brian? Yep. Second? Second. All righty. Okay. We're ready to go. Um, Trustee Becker is current, sorry, he's currently experiencing some power issues. So we are going to get started without him and hopefully he will get his power back and be able to join us while we're um, going through the meeting. So we are gonna pick up where we left off. We had a motion to re-adjust um, the agenda. So we are looking at, we're under education and we're looking at item D, posting of standards. And I think Vicki, you're gonna speak to that. Right, I'll, I'll just repeat what I had said earlier that um, I was to, I jumped the gun on posting this in June and it actually has to be posted in July. It's just a formality, a statutory requirement uh, for all of our districts in the state of Wisconsin to post the standards at the start of a school year, which is July for us. Alrighty, then our next agenda item is E, land acknowledgement. Vicki, is that you too? Well, I'll just take the time to introduce Angie Lacombe. Um, Angie's been working on this. She'll talk a little bit about the back background. And I know um, one of our board members also has participated in it. We're very excited for this next step. So Angie. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm here tonight as the First Nations Program Manager um, for Green Bay Schools. And um, one of the projects that came about at the very start of the year was um, a request to revise the former um, land acknowledgement statement. And so um, what happened was that uh, uh, we were able to pull together different groups throughout the district. So we were able to um, work with not only the First Nations program, but we had representatives from other departments within the, within the district. Um, we offered, um, we, we took a lot of pathways, I think, to try to get more people involved in the process. Um, that was really important for us to have voice in the process. And so um, ultimately what happened was that um, we did do some research, a small committee, we did some research on best practices for writing land acknowledgements. And then we put out a um, survey to anyone in the district who would like to participate. So um, we did have some responses from teachers, um, one of our schools, a classroom submitted a response, some students, and um, some of our First Nations specialists. And so then the committee went ahead and read through those responses and kind of tried to pull the essence of each of them and craft a land acknowledgement that we felt represented the voices of those who had submitted um, ideas for the land acknowledgement. And so tonight we're here um, because we finalized that work. And so we would like to begin a rollout of the land acknowledgement. Um, and so you have in front of you in your documents, the protocols that we would like to use as we are um, using the land acknowledgement within the district. Um, and our ask of the board is that you would consider reading the land acknowledgement at regular board meetings as well. Angie, I believe protocol is that the eldest, how, how does that work? Who should do the? Um, yeah, so through our research we did, we looked at other um, institutions and um, corporations that use land acknowledgements. And it is typically the um, senior most um, representative of the organization. So for example, um, if the chancellor is available at, at UWGB, he would be the one that would read that. Thank you, and then I just have one more. Um, if you could uh, please tell us who's with you tonight, and then I'm wondering if it can be formally read. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I should give a couple of acknowledgements. Of course, the, the team that I work every day with um, was integral in this process. And then um, Mindy Frank, who works at East High School, but is also a parent um, of a First Nation student in our district, also served on the team. There were other committee members who were who wanted to be here tonight um, and had it planned to, but due to the weather, um, decided to stay home. Um, and of course, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Brenda because, um, I'm so sorry, Laura, um, because um, she worked- It's okay, Brenda was here a long time. I know, I know, I'm so sorry. Um, I do know your name. <laughs> um, Laura, uh, because she's been with us throughout the process. So um, as a member of the, um, I, she attends the, the PAC meetings. And so she's heard of the process throughout the year um, and has provided me some valuable input um, and insights into this process as well. Um, and so that is, those are the members that are here. And um, I guess I would also just like to say, and this I should have said first, that the, the reason that we're here and that we want to do this is because we truly believe that this is an opportunity for us to acknowledge um, the indigenous people of Wisconsin whose land our schools rest on. And we also want to use that as a first step to say that we want to build partnerships with our local communities and, and the indigenous parents and students within our school. So that, that's what I should have led with and I apologize for that. Um, but yes, I would love to read the statement um, for you. We, the members of the Green Bay Area Public School District recognize and honor the original inhabitants of Northeast Wisconsin. Our district lives, works and learns upon the ancestral homelands of the Menominee and Ho-Chunk nations and the current homeland of Oneida nation. We acknowledge the 12 diverse and vibrant Wisconsin First Nations who have persevered here since before recorded time and continue to be integral parts of our community. We uphold our responsibility to repair relationships, initiate partnerships, and stand with all First Nations communities. Thank you. Um, so this will get added to board docs on the agenda for- No action required. Okay, awesome. But no, we'll add it. I know that <laughs> we will add it to the agenda, though, for um, for, you know, with the mission statement for um, our president to read at our meetings, if everybody's in agreement. Awesome. Okay, Kinsey, you can do that for us for our next meeting. Thank you. 
thank you so much for um, doing this. I think it speaks a lot to um, the vision and commitment that our district has for all of its students and parents. Um, and thank you for having me here tonight. As oh, sorry. Thank you for your work. This is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Get home safe. All righty, then we are going to go up back. We're under education. We're going to go to item B, school security update. Vicki, who's presenting for that? I'll go ahead and start. Um, I'm joined today by the safety and security coordinator, Chris Collar. Um, we recognized after the most recent school shooting that we have new board members that weren't a part of all the security updates that we went through in 2018. And felt this was a good opportunity to have Chris present and respond to any questions that the board members might have. So with that, I turn it over to Mr. Collar. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm assuming that you all have the memo that uh, is attached with the agenda. The purpose of the memo was to basically give an overview of what has been required uh, for uh, safety and security uh, for school districts across the state and kind of in a, a, a timeline of how that took place. So um, under uh, letter I, or I'm sorry, numeral one, um, Act 309 in 2010, the Wisconsin legislature passed 2009, Wisconsin Act 309, which required districts to create safety plans um, with active participation of law enforcement, fire department, school administrators, and other professionals. Uh, Green Bay School did participate in that as required, and our safety plan um, was put in place. Uh, we have a, quite a robust safety and security plan here in the district. Um, and in my time here, we've had many other districts and other school safety organizations um, request uh, copies or request to be able to see what we have um, because it, it, it's very well done. Um, things that were also required as part of that plan were requiring to conduct monthly fire drills, two school safety evacuation drills and one tornado drill. Uh, in 2018, the Wisconsin legislature enacted 2017 Wisconsin Act 143. That act uh, created the Office of School Safety and provided $100 million to districts across the state for safety improvements. Um, another, other things that were added as part of that is that districts were required to submit floor plans and school safety plans to the state and local law enforcement. Uh, school boards are required to review written evaluations of school violence drills and documentation needs to be submitted to the state. And site security assessments must be completed for each school or building where students are present on a regular basis every three years. So when that passed, um, I did go with, with our SROs and we went down to all of our, our buildings in the district and we included all of our model three sites and then any other uh, spaces that we had students, which would include uh, the daycares um, that had students and then um, any, any, any areas that we had kids. That, three-year window uh, came up and then we had to redo the assessments um, in the past year, which were completed prior to uh, December 31st of 2021. Um, at the end of each school year, I'm required to submit several pieces of information uh, to the Department of Justice through an, an online portal um, indicating that we did our drills, that we, if we've made any upgrades to our safety plan, that we completed our site assessments and other things of that nature. Um, after uh, one Act 143 was completed um, there and the site assessments were completed, I found that there was a few things that we were missing from our safety plan. So I, along with uh, the security committee that we had, created some new pieces which were added and adopted to the, the safety plan and, and approved by the school board at that time. Um, one of the big things that came out with the creation of the Office of School Safety is uh, the Wisconsin Threat Assessment Protocol. Um, we use that threat assessment protocol to um, have our, our administrators, student services staff, if they have situations where um, something's happening with students and we feel that there's a reason to complete a threat assessment that um, they use that tool to properly assess the situation, ask all the proper questions, determine what level the, the, the threat might be. And then uh, it requires there to be um, a deeper dive if it's a higher level secure, uh, of threat. And if it's a lower level, then it just, there's a follow-up and some um, back end things we're making sure that uh, if they need to be met with more often or if there's things that need to be put in place that should be done. Um, in, 
2022, we updated the reunification process. Um, the actual safety plan will be coming to the board uh, this summer. Uh, and it's, it was last approved in, a, in August of 2019. So it's due to be approved by August of 2022 as required by, by the state law. Um, one, some of the pieces that we're updating in there mostly is um, title changes as, every, as the plan has been around. Uh, we've changed the names of some of the positions that are in leadership. So we got to make sure those are accurate. And then we've uh, updated the reunification process. Um, the I Love You Guys Foundation has a really good uh, reunification procedure in place. And um, I've attended some training. We actually got the, the team that we would use if we were to have to reunify students together. And we went over the plan. Um, and we will continue to do that on an annual basis to make sure that um, as people come and go, they know what their role might be. Um, in 2018, the, uh, the $100 million that I spoke about before, uh, the, our district, uh, there was two levels to that grant. Um, we received about almost $2 million from that safety grant. And we used those funds to make a lot of improvements across the district, um, adding a lot of interior and exterior cameras and door cameras. Uh, we added servers to, up to support those cameras. Um, additional radios in the building for uh, quicker access to staff when they need it. Um, we upgraded PA systems in buildings that had older ones. We added speakers um, in areas of schools that might not have them and in the outside of the building. Um, we uh, added a security film to the exit doors or the entrance doors of our buildings or the side light glass. Um, this is uh, a film is designed to make it more difficult for someone to get through the window. It's not a bullet resistant film. It's a, it's a security film that's designed if someone were to try to break out the window, it's kind of like your car windshield where it's got a layer of plastic on it so that the, the glass might shatter and it might get holes in it, but it's not gonna break off in pieces and um, allow someone easy access into the building. Um, we had our staff attend some trauma sensitive schools training, which was required by the grant. We added additional panic buttons across the district and we purchased an a, a emergency notification software that we use um, to notify the buildings when there's events happening in other buildings, notify our traveling staff, notify, um, you know, you used to use it to notify the private schools, now the police department's doing that, some of that for us. Had some other training, uh, mental health, Edelson to help, uh, citizen aid, first aid, trauma kits were placed in the buildings. Um, we rekeyed the exterior doors to all of our buildings. Um, over the years, we found that there were lots of master keys that were floating around with different people. So we rekeyed those uh, doors so that we now have better uh, control of who's got physical keys. Everybody's got a badge and we'd rather them use their badge to gain access. That way we can track who's where. When people had physical keys, we didn't really know who was going where. Um, and then we added some card access and door monitoring in different places. Um, Back in 2013, the district started the ALICE training, which um, continues to this day. Um, our staff review the ALICE procedures with our students on an annual basis. We conduct uh, drills during the year. Again, I said we were required to do two uh, safety security drills. One of them is required to be an evacuation to a rally point. Um, because now that is required that after each of those drills, a report is sent to the, the board, um, I do give the schools a, about a two week window to conduct those drills, typically in September, and then again in, in January or February. Um, we require that they do the evacuation drill in September so students that are new to the building will know where they need to go in the event of an emergency. And then in the spring, we uh, are in the, uh, after the new year, buildings can do any one of our other type of uh, security drills that they uh, want to get some practice with. Um, another thing that was added with, uh, the Office of School Safety is the Speak Up, Speak Out Wisconsin platform. They use grant funding to create um, this program, which has an anonymous tip line, which is monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week by uh, the Wisconsin Capitol Police. It also provided a website that has lots of good information, safety information, updates, and uh, information that we use to train our students. They, they created a elementary level a PowerPoint program and a high school, middle school level program that um, I did a video of and submitted to all the buildings. And then we had our, our, our building played the videos for the students. Um, the main basis of that platform is to speak up, speak out, you know, see something, say something. 
and giving them, you know, an understanding of uh, what some of the things are that you might want to tell somebody about and talking about who are our trusted adults in our building and, um, you know, what you can tell them and, you know, where to find them. Um, we also have continued our partnership with the Crime Stoppers uh, of Green Bay. Um, our SRO program um, uses the Crime Stoppers, the um, Student Stopping Crime platform. Um, so we have two different anonymous tip lines that can be used in our buildings, both which are promoted to our students. We have, uh, uh, over the years, we've received um, donations of media boards, similar to what you have in the boardroom there. We've got them located at the high schools and middle schools. They were purchased by Crime Stoppers, and uh, the schools use them to put out, you know, a lot of information to their students. And part of that is, you know, uh, having different um, flyers related to Crime Stoppers explaining what that is and how people can uh, use to make anonymous tips and things of that nature. Um, then the last things are board policy. Uh, I know the 700 series board policies just recently were brought to you, which, you know, talk about the uh, procedures for student security, our school safety plans, emergency drills, and our visitor procedures, all which are um, required and um, are up to date. Um, earlier, I don't, I believe it was in January, um, we conducted some webinars. I conducted a webinar, um, I created a webinar for parents, basically explaining the ALICE protocols and what they can do and what would, uh, in, in those situations, um, what they should do, they find information out, um, about what's happening. And we have those posted on the district website. Um, and I believe those are in multiple languages. Um, there was some online safety and some social emotional learning safety that was done as well. So does anyone have any questions about me rambling for that long? Thanks for the update. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, 2018 grant dollars, one time injection of cash. Um, the effective lifespan of some of the equipment that you purchased at that time. Um, I would appreciate servers and stuff like that over five years. So we're coming up on a renewal cycle. Is this now a burden for the operational budget, like fund 10 budget? Or is there an expectation that some of our technologies might not be replaced and thus diminishing our security plan if we don't receive additional um, injection of cash? So right now the servers that we have, we've, we've had some issues with them. They're still under warranty. So things that we've run into have been, have been taken care of. When you purchase the cameras, we purchased uh, additional warranty and backend service with those to make sure that um, if we had issues uh, that they were covered and we were being taken care of. I know that some of those have come up and we've extended um, some of the, the warranties or service life of the, the cameras. One thing that we did after the grant was over, we had extra funding that we were able to go back and replace all of the old cameras that were in place. So I believe it was in 2019, we basically had brand new cameras across the entire district all on a higher megapixel resolution. Um, and they're, they are all are, um, they might be getting close to being out of that, that warranty, but we still have extended um, updates and things that we're getting that we can push out firmware wise. Okay, just to follow up so then clear, there's no expectation that you'll come back and request additional funding to maintain the security on plan in the near future as far as uh, when we're talking about the next budget or the 23-24 budget. Um, as we review those docs this summer where this is not uh, a part of that, right? Correct. I won't be asking for funding um, to make, make any major upgrades. And actually, we're constantly looking for any other grant opportunities that we can get to, to upgrade things of that nature. Oh, could, could I just add to that really quick? Um, there is a discussion right now in Washington on gun control proposals that would actually have funds to help support schools in this manner. So if it gets through the House and Senate, then uh, hopefully when we need the funds, it will be there. Sorry, Brian. Chris, is there um, data that shows how many students have contacted any of these resources, uh, whether from Brown County or within the district itself for either the security, um, the Crime Stoppers numbers or 
even reaching out for uh, student support numbers that have been listed as some of these resources. I don't Available. have. I don't have specific. The mailbox is full and cannot accept any messages at this time. Goodbye. Am I still on? You are. We just had a snafu. Carry on. All right. So to answer your question, um, I don't know that there's specific numbers. I know the Crime Stoppers on their monthly meetings, they do put out lists of all the tips that come in. And, you know, there are definitely tips that come in related to things in our buildings. Um, if we need to, if you want me to get some numbers, I can. I know that the Speak Up, Speak Out platform was used a lot in the last year, especially when we had all the the uh, threats that occurred with Preble and East, um, we got probably a ballpark numbers we were probably around the 20 to 25 tips that came in using that platform. Um, I don't know if it tracks people that go onto the website and, and use resources, but um, I could find out. So we are seeing that students are embracing this and utilizing the school, the uh, tools and resources that we have available for them. Absolutely, we are. Anything else? Oh, Laura. I um, just want to thank you, Chris. We don't get to see you very often, so it's always nice when you when you come to our, our meetings um, because I always find your reports uh, very reassuring. Um, and I, 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 when I first spoke to Vicki about having this on the agenda, I thought now it might be a good time. Um, we have a lot of anxious parents and students and um, Obviously, we're all aware of what's going on in the larger world around this issue. So, um, uh, again, it's good to see you. Thank you for doing this, um, letting us know everything that the district's doing um, behind the scenes. These are things that we don't, um, that aren't necessarily out there front and center, but to know that they're happening um, in, a, in a very thorough kind of way um, just gives me, um, as a, gives me a lot of comfort and I hope other people as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any other questions? We're gonna let Chris go. All right, thank you for joining us tonight, hanging in there during the tornadoes. <laughs> Have a good night. Okay, the next item on the agenda, we're under education, item F, school start times. Vicki, are you gonna to speak to this? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped C. Yes, so we're gonna talk about PK online school names. Vicki, are you gonna talk about this? <laughs> Sure, thank you. <laughs> and I think um, Andrea and Adam were going to try to join by phone. Not sure if they were able to come in, but I'll go ahead and tee it up. And then um, Mr. Lyerly served on the committee. So um, if he wants to jump in at any point, that would be great. Um, we came to the board, uh, I think the last two months in a row to talk about our pre-K through uh, five online school and uh, picking a name for it. And following board policy, a committee was formed and it included a board member, uh, Adam as the building level administrator, four staff members, one parent, three fifth grade students, and an individual from the community. They met twice and they came forward with three recommendations for the board to consider for a vote at the regular board meeting later this month. The three choices are Katherine Johnson Academy of Enriched Virtual Learning, Mosaic Academy of Enriched Virtual Learning, and Learning Beyond Boundaries Academy. Uh, and they did want me to note that they are in no particular order. Okay, so I leave it to the board for discussion and Mr. Lyerly, if you have any additional comments. Just to add to that, the committee did um, entertain a lot of different um, options. And this, these three are about, it's about, um, uh, I think we ended up with like 12 um uh, options and we went through a couple different rounds of voting across the committee and ended up with these three being pretty equal in votes received right that's why they're not in any order um you know and one of the things that we were very sensitive to is that unlike other schools in the district there is an intent to market 
this school and to attract students to it. And so we, we, there was an elimination process by which we did consider, is this a marketable name? Um, and so the only other point I would want to add, not to bias any um, decisions that we did have a consultation with our attorney because we recognize that the Katherine Johnson Academy of Enriched Learning, if you read the policy, there is verbiage that um, if you name a facility after a deceased person, um, that person should be um, deceased for at least 10 years. And that is not the case for Ms. Johnson, um, but the consultation uh, with her indicated that the word should meant that we should take it under advisement and it was not a directive um, that we could not choose that name. So that's why it's included uh, if you're familiar with the policy. Um, but you know, ultimately um, we, we think that uh, Catherine Johnson uh, as uh, detailed in the rationale and the research has several characteristics and, and qualities about her life, her professional career um, that uh, lend it to be a good choice um, for a, a, um, a school that is based on technology and is on what we want to be um, known to be on the cutting edge um, and breaking new ground. Um, a mosaic, as you read in the research, a little bit more nuanced, but one of the first browsers used um, to communicate between systems was mosaic. Um, but from a marketing perspective, we, we saw a lot of opportunities um, to, to use that um, and allow people to attach different meanings to it, all of them pretty supportive of the mission um, out there. And of course, learning beyond boundaries because um, it, this, the building will have no boundaries. So um, that's all I would like to add. Melissa, do you know why the policy had the 10 years? For the person to be deceased, I, I, I guess I'm just wondering if what the rationale was behind that. I don't know exactly, but I, from putting the policy together, because this is a recently re revised policy, um, in the WASB guidance regarding um, proposed language, they suggest a, a longer period because a person after a person passes away, um, it's very highly emotional and there's a lot of people who may see um, not the extended value of naming something long-term um, because of the high emotion and, and that sort of thing. But in addition to that, um, the lasting impact and the lasting legacy, what does that look like 10 years down the road, five years down the road, 15 down, years down the road? And is it not just an immediate legacy, but a, a lasting legacy? And when we were putting this forward, we did that research and Ms. Johnson's contributions were made in the 60s. Um, and uh, uh, she has won almost every award that the president will give someone, um, has a building name at NASA named after and a school in Virginia already named after as well. So we felt like, those criteria had been met, right? We don't have a situation where there will be something reputational that they find out after the facts um, and the um, died peacefully, um, uh, you know, at, at, in their 80s or 90s. So, yeah. Is there any um, precedent set for most of our schools are named after presidents and? local leaders as far as reaching out to the estate or the family if we were to go with the first one to either I don't want to say necessarily get permission but to get permission or to acknowledge and recognize that fact I know with our most recent school we had reached out to their families and and was well represented as far as the naming with that so I don't know if there's a policy with that or not or practice so the policy only establishes that we have to ask permission of a living person um, and there was nothing specifically in that policy around that. If my memory serves me correctly, I believe the old policy did have a preference uh, for local leaders and, um, and um, it may have even included presidents, but when we revised the policy, the board moved away from that, given that there are a number of individuals who contribute to our society, not just local, who 
who would um, be worthy of naming a school after. I believe that was the case. No, it's all you, Brian. Um, was it intentional to not have Green Bay in any of the titles for these? When you see other online schools, they don't have necessarily the district within the, the name of the school or did it just kind of shake out that way? <clears throat> I would say it shook out that way because we wanted um, in, to identify the methodologies that were uh, employed. Um, we didn't want it just to be virtual or online. Um, so therefore we added the word enriched because we wanted to make sure that they understood that there was contact and it wasn't like a um, the Wisconsin State um, online school. Um, so it just started getting really long um, and wordy. So there's not a preference. It was just how do we kind of, what were the key things that we wanted to communicate in the name? Anyone else? So is this, is this the time where we actually talk about our preferences? Is this not, yeah, now's the time. So speak up everybody if you have, if you have a preference, um, I'll just say for myself, I would, um, I've narrowed it down to two, uh, Catherine Johnson Academy of Enriched Virtual Learning and Mosaic Academy of Enriched Virtual Learning. Um, and it's gonna be hard for me personally to, you know, if it's those two to, to choose which one it is. So that's where I am right now on this. Anyone else? Before we continue, ultimately question number one is, are you satisfied with the three choices that were put forward? Because going back and, and, and directing the committee to go back and do a, another round, we're trying to be sensitive to the enrollment cycle and um, make the selection. That's why we're kind of um, pushing this. Oh, oh, sorry. I just hit my button before then. Um, I guess this question might be for Lori through the chair. Um, when we decide to market this, I'd like for some recognition that this is a Green Bay School District because we still have a lot to offer being a large urban, a large district in Northeast Wisconsin that I think we should figure out some way to tie the name in, if not the official, you know, we don't say Washington Middle School of the Green Bay Area Public School District, but I prefer that somehow it's recognized within that. So when we do a lot of, so when I think about how are we going to market this, right? So uh, it's website, we'll have the district logo at the bottom, just like all of the schools do. Um, when we put it on social media, we usually always include the district logo and things so that, because um, it's going to be important, right? That people do know this is a Green Bay Public School District school. It's important for if they need to open enroll, they need to know who to open enroll with. So it's going to be a key part of our efforts is making sure people know you know, not only that it's part of the district, but also, you know, what the process is in order to open enroll in as well as then to actually fill out the actual application for the school. Anyone else? Anyone want to share their thoughts and opinions? I, I, I like all of them. I will tell you my preference is the Katherine Johnson Academy of Enriched um, Virtual Learning. From a policy perspective, if you read it, they do want the selection committee to um, uh, consider and be sensitive to minority, to uh, a, um, a set of characteristics outlined in that policy. And from that perspective, it's, yeah, it is a, a very good um, uh, choice. Brian? Oh, Laura. Okay. <laughs> it's Laura's turn now, Brian. <laughs> I was just going to say that I, my preference was Katherine Johnson. I was super excited when I saw that um, we have the Barbie. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, but also I think, I think the representation of her as a, as a woman and a woman of color. Um, and then just a side comment, I think um, I would like to see us get away from the term of minority using that language in, in, within the district and use person of color or something like that because truly not even an accurate 
term anymore with population. So sure. Thank you. This is I love I, all of them are great, but that's my favorite. Brian. This would this will not be voted on until the next meeting, though, correct? Right. Just especially with such a I mean, all of our decisions are important in discussion, but knowing that we lost one due to technology while we're talking about right. advancing technology. I'd hope that we can get the feedback as well from um, our member that's not here. Is it possible to put up like a quick survey on the district website and get community feedback? Or would that become more of a challenge? Um, we could do um, what we could do is we could email off. I mean, I don't know if you want how broad of it you want. So we could email all families in the district, right? And that way, as well as do a Facebook post allowing. No, I, well, I just have a test. Okay. <laughs> So I, I understand why you would want to do that, but my concern is the policy is pretty clear as to what the process is, and I don't want to undermine the policy in the stakeholders, especially the voice of the school who was at the table and naming the school. So my, my preference would be if you want that sort of thing to happen that we amend the policy in the future going forward, but that we stick to this policy and this pr procedure this time. If someone felt strongly about this as any issue, they could email their board members and let them know. That's the purpose of the two weeks between the work session and the board meeting. We can't have a motion tonight. It's, it will be at the next meeting. All righty, anything else? James, good work. I think that there are three solid names. Everyone that participated from the school, the parents, the students, all did a great job. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us here tonight. Okay, now, sorry, I got all befuddled with, you know, switching things around and then hanging out in the basement. We're um, education. We are on item F, school start times. All right, I will take this one as well. And I think uh, Chad Jensma and Lynette Kino are here in case there are questions that come up. Um, the process of school start time uh, discussion began years ago and a task force was created that was facilitated by Jeff Dickert at CESA 7. It, um, I, I don't even know if anybody in this room was on that task force. Mike was? Okay. Yeah, so- I, I attended three or four meetings. Okay, so Laura attended three or four. Um, to James' point earlier, a lot of the people that probably were on the task force might not even be around anymore. So uh, we did link within the memo um, access to, you have to dig in though, um, access to the recommendations that were brought forward to the Board of Education several years ago. Uh, and then COVID struck. And Andrew, uh, after we returned to school face-to-face, -face. Andrew asked that we bring this topic to the education committee, which we did back in August of this year. And after that meeting, uh, well, actually during that meeting, there was a discussion about uh, next steps and transportation costs, looking into that. So Chad Jensma, who, yep, there he is. Hi, Chad, uh, director of transportation, did reach out to uh, our two bus companies, Lamers and First Student, and receive some preliminary information. Um, be before we go to Chad, I just wanna share that uh, initially what we're hearing from the two bus companies gives me pause, um, especially when we take a look at the budget situation we are headed into, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue looking into this and uh, presenting more information to the Board of Education. So I've outlined in the memo what I believe should be the next steps in this process. Number one, confirming the additional busing cost because that is what we are hearing, that it will be an extra cost to the district. And then reviewing the budget to verify if this added expense is something the district can absorb. If we determine at that point, yes, um, financially, we can move forward with the plan. 
The second step for me would be to take a look at the workload on our team and the priorities and determine if this is something we can take on at that time. If yes, then the next step would be to work with Lynette, who may have already been considering the viability for her staff and any budget impact for the food service. If that looks viable, um, I would recommend then that we work with the departments, different departments and building leadership to identify and address any barriers that some were outlined in the task force um, report. And uh, there might be some new ones now that we hadn't considered at that time a few years ago. After that, I think it would be important before the Board of Education made a vote um, to go with one of the two proposals that we also survey our staff and our parents to see if they uh, feel this is something that would be in the best interest of the district and work for their families. Um, so I don't know if we wanna have questions first or do we wanna hear from Chad? Yeah, does anybody have any initial questions? Otherwise we'll let Chad go. I have questions, but I will take that. Okay, first Chad, you ready? I'm ready. Good evening, everybody. Um, so as Vicki uh, stated, we've got a couple of things at play here as we look at transportation, as I pick, uh, pick this piece up from previous work and um, all, the, all the hard efforts that gone into this. Um, talking with both, both Lamers and FIRST student, um, what, what I was finding was the, the need for additional routes. Um, and they're still kind of um, trying to figure out a little bit more of that. Basically, it's because the tiers would change how we use buses. Basically, we can use them for uh, two or three schools, just depending on the time and the length of the routes. So right now that, you know, we try to run them as, efficient, as efficiently as possible. And certainly with any changes, we would do the same. However, just knowing what these uh, timeframes look like and the ability to uh, create the tiers to be efficient, um, it would we would need additional um, uh, buses and drivers. So the, the biggest concern I heard, um, I heard a little concern about getting equipment with the, with the shortages of parts and different things as far as timelines. Um, but as Vicki and I talked uh, a little bit about this, um, if it was out of enough time and we knew it was necessary to be uh, done, we certainly would have enough lead time to get the equipment. However, the major concern that I was hearing and the concern I was dealing with uh, for this year, and I'm certain a number of you have heard the same concern, um, is uh, the number of drivers uh, for activity routes or for, for um, the school day routes. They were able to do a great job for us and cover those. So I'm very proud of our contractors. Um, as we talked um, with them, as I talked with them, um, they were able to fill the seats this year and be creative. But it seemed like every time they gained somebody, they might have lost two or they might have gained two and lost one. So they kept it kind of at a level plank, uh, level field as far as things went this year. Um, and with that, you know, looking at additional drivers, that certainly was the concern that I was hearing from them. Um, and obviously with additional drivers and, and buses, we'd have additional routes, as I just stated. Um, so there would be an increase in, in cost for the transportation overall. Anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a lot of questions, but not all of them are pertinent for tonight's conversation. Um, but uh, the superintendent laid out five steps that what she sees as the next action items. In reviewing the memo, then the um, suggestions that were presented from the task force to or were to be presented to the board. And, I, and I'm confused as to whether or not they actually made it to a regular board meeting. And I think I, I need some clarification there and I'll do further research, but it was the result of the CISA 7 report. And honestly, that was a very difficult report to consume. Um, it's very complicated, um, but I don't know if um, the board needs to actually act on that task force recommendation. And then, cause I don't know if there's a, a difference in your approach or expense 
if we chose option A or option B, uh, honestly. And it looks like the the document, the CSA 7, um, made it sound like there are pros and cons um, to each one of these, these options. Um, so first question is, do we do these five steps just to validate and to supplement the information we have to qualify option A or option B? Or by doing that, have we just taken a task force, you know, 14 meetings worth of work, set it aside, and now we're doing additional work to come up with option C or a you know, no action um, item? Um, no action was required at the time it was presented, so you probably won't find it on a regular board meeting uh, unless Mike Stengel or Melissa have other information about that one. I believe it was presented at a work session and that was it. Uh, it was it was presented at, in education. Right. But at, at the time, at the time, there was not uh, under under that system, the committee I think wanted to look at it some more, but unfortunately in that not very well defined system at that time, I think there wasn't a clear understanding. I, I think that we have had historically that things get discussed in committee and then do get moved to the board and either get voted on or, or tabled or, or whatnot. So I, I would say my perspective is that it was presented in the education committee and has been somewhat somewhat frozen there, which is you know part of why I'm uh, part of why I wanted to see it on on this um, you know on this this agenda. But I think it was it was presented a few months ago in, in education. Right, I, I had mentioned that uh, Mr. Becker. I think you were weren't able to join us early on. I had mentioned that we did bring it to you. Okay, thank you. So this was another, when I was on the superintendent advisory committee, this was another thing that came forward to our group to work through. And, and so the discussion was was really good at that time. And I, and I recall there being clear research that this was better for the students to have that little bit extra time of sleep for that age group. So that was pretty clear. I. I I know it was the whole concern of how do we make it work in such a large district with all these factors. Um, so I'm not sure what the next steps are, but I do think that if, if we're finding that that's the best thing for our students that we deserve to, to definitely take a look at that. Um, I know in the, it was all captured in the notes, the number of concerns. I, re, I recall a big one with the parents that I was with in the group was that it would disrupt their athlete, after school athletics. Um, I know there's more beyond that, absolutely, but. Um, I think it's worth looking at and but I'm with James I don't want to spend a whole bunch of resources but you also spent a lot of resources and time and energy already on it to not um, give it a shot at a stronger look. Brian. I also asked for this to be brought back up because I think I think it's important work that was done beforehand but I recognize the fact that this also is bigger than just Green Bay that every every decision that we would make will impact athletic teams in our conference. It'll impact busing routes, I'm sure for availability through the drivers. And I think this is a decision or something that needs to be addressed either on a county level with, if, if this can be brought up, I, I'm assuming there's still a Brown County superintendent meetings that happen or at a CESA level, um, because we won't be able to come in and have this be successful with just Green Bay doing it, just as was mentioned. And, and while it seems like it's a, I don't wanna say a minor thing, Shifting that time impacts everyone's master schedule for any extracurricular event. It could become a great opportunity for us to increase the number of officials that are available to have a 4.30 start time instead of a 4 o'clock start time. It could be beneficial in a lot of areas there, but I think we need to look at it in some way, um, whether it's through CESA or whether it's through the Brown County or through the conference commissioners or, or who would address it. Um, I don't want it to necessarily get pushed to the back burner on it. Um, but I think that there's, we need to involve the other groups again and look at it. We, we showed some great adaptations when COVID hit and the ability to kind of think outside the box. And I think 
there's ways that we can do it. I don't think it's our most pressing issue right now, but you know, we, we looked at shortages with the district I work in as far as bus drivers for a small field trip and four of us just decided to share the bus from four different districts to pick up because of the small number of students and the flexibility there. So I think there's some creative solutions there. I don't think it is our number one priority right now, um, but I hope with the online school, whenever we decide the name is, that we also take into consideration that because they obviously have a little bit more flexibility as far as start times and it could be another selling point with that. So thank you. So, our, oh, I'm sorry, James. So I don't know that we need to do all five of these items because it seems like a lot of work. It feels like there's some control gates, right? If we look into the cost associated with changing the routes and we get a report back on just that, given the fact that we had a presentation from the CFO this evening about operational um, you know, issues and uh, operational budget issues, um, I'd like if to determine if we can take a more staged approach. And once we clear one hurdle, because I agree with Brian, it, that he hadn't even thought about impact to other schools and, and, and when it comes to athletics. So um, if we could maybe make uh, direct the district to modify what we discuss on, at, the, at the regular um, board meeting to um, kind of stage gate, number one, let's look at expenses and then have a discussion and allow the board to um, kind of vote on whether or not you should even continue. If that if that makes sense. So based on what I'm hearing, we are waiting for um, understanding the feasibility of hiring additional bus drivers and um, the cost associated with that. And once we have that, I don't know how long that will take. Chad, I don't know if you're able to provide a you know, a soft ETA for when we might have that information. But once we have that information, we'll bring this back to another work session for a conversation. Brian? And I would like informal conversations had with, um, whether it's Brown County superintendents or whatever group the cabinet feels is appropriate because this is going to impact others and see if they're even on board with the concept of changing these start times, because I think the the systematic shift of it could alleviate some of these costs on it if we look at this you know for wherever lamers and first june operate how they can make this work as far as the transportation part if if the whole community does it then i think it alleviates some of those issues so and i think chad would share that um the primary partnership we would need to develop that would impact us most greatly as far as school districts are our private schools here in green bay is that correct, Chad? Oh, that would be accurate. Yes, we we certainly have to have them involved, and in, and like uh, Brian was talking about with the athletics and just the the whole concept. Um, I, I've listened to the conversation, and um, certainly I've got some things to to take a look at and be able to get some information together. Okay. Anybody have anything else? All righty, Chad. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm sorry, Lynette is here. Um, Lynette, did you want to add anything? Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I would just want to add regarding with food service and um, also other um, departments within our district, there would be some added costs to those departments on the availability for us to have food available at the elementary schools at an earlier time. And then there would be also then a shift for some of the secondary schools for our employees who are now, they have a higher FTE. And with the change of those times, um, their FTE or their benefits um, and hourly, of uh, the time of hours they would be working per day would be also cut um, at the secondary levels. So, um, I would be concerned at the secondary level with the staffing, but then at elementary level, we would have an increase of staffing with hours there. 
So um, I wanted to add that. And, and then also with our trucks that are on the road delivering products at, uh, to all of our schools. And I understand it's a scheduling that um, would go into place and change is good too. Um, but we would also have to make sure that we're able to do this um, with what we are looking at here in our district. And also um, with the end time at some of our schools, being at like 2.30 and our secondary schools later, we do have a lot of families within our district who really rely on those older students to watch those children at home and to be care providers for them. And, um, and I know that that is something that I am looking at and that was also in the discussion um, on the task force. I was part of the committee and um, that was something that was discussed. And as Brian talked in the meeting tonight um, F, with the athletic times and everything, I think that's a great idea to reach out to other districts um, because it would really touch other districts and how, not even with our athletics, but also with musicals and other pieces too. So thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Okay, anything else? All righty, then that concludes the education portion of the agenda and Laura, Layton, and Warren will be taking over and facilitating policy and governance. Okay, we'll um, get started with policy and governance. Um, part A, we'll wait for our attorney to join us at the table. First one is um, policy 170, postings of board meetings. And um, this is um, coming forward as a result of our, our little bit of a delay we had this week to address that. Thanks, Laura. So I've included in uh, on board docs the memo that we provided to the board regarding the legal requirements for posting of board meetings. As noted in the memo, the board, um, I, since I've been here in January of 2003, I'm guessing years and years and years before that, has decided to meet the obligations of the open meetings law by posting, paying for a, a publication in a newspaper of the jurisdiction that the Green Bay School District is in, and that that has met the posting requirements for our regular board meetings. There's another option to meet the posting requirements under the law, and that's to post the notices in three public places. And we sometimes have to do that um, based on the requirements of a statute, such as for our budget meetings or defeasance. So what I'm recommending in order to not have this happen again is that the board move to meeting the statutory requirements by posting in the three public places. We can always overachieve. And so I'm also recommending that we continue to post in the Green Bay Press Gazette regarding our meeting notices, but that if something happens again with respect to not um, being published 24 hours prior to the meeting, that we will have met the meeting notice obligations by having it posted in three public places. And we continue obviously to use our, our website. And then just so that the public would be aware, I included in the memo my recommendation as to what we would put on our website on the board page so that the public would be aware of how our meetings are posted, where they're posted, and then um, if those three sites aren't available, where the backup sites are. Does anybody have any questions, Brian? And Melissa, if this isn't tied into this, please. Let me know. Um, is there any thing that would be blocking us from also printing these in Spanish and posting those at the same locations? Nothing prohibiting us. Uh, it would be capacity of the ability to get those translated in time. For example, our translators don't work over the summer. So we would be working with our um, EL department to figure out how we could get those translated. But um, I, I know on our website, because they're posted on our website, that we have Google Translate. So that is something that um, is available for families as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Next, we'll move on to policy 
411.1 harassment and or bullying by or towards students. So some of you may recall uh, in August of 2020, the federal government did a large scale revision to Title IX that caused us to have to revise our policies related to Title IX in addition to um, our employment policies relating to non-discrimination because Title IX now applies to employees as well. We um, were waiting for the state because the state had advised that they were going to revise the state's version of the non-discrimination laws uh, that didn't necessarily include Title IX, but the non-discrimination laws and um, do some pretty substantial changes. So we didn't revise policy 411.1 to reflect what we needed to reflect with respect to Title IX because we were waiting for the state. It appears the state is not moving forward with that work anymore. So now we're bringing the changes that were necessary to make to policy 411.1 uh, forward to comply with Title IX. Any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is just the rule following that policy. So just like with um, policies 511, 512, we're recommending that we repeal rule 411.1 and just refer back to policy 411 for purposes of the procedure because otherwise they were duplicative and then it can get confusing as to which procedure applies. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move on to D, policy 457, suicide prevention intervention. Thank you. Um, the state of Wisconsin made some pretty significant changes to the statutes that apply to suicide prevention and intervention. Our pupil services team led by Christina Jingle um, worked a large part of this year to make sure that not only was our policy statutorily compliant, but also reflected the best practices and the practices here in the Green Bay School District. So that's what we're bringing forward tonight for your consideration. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Next, we're moving on to E, policy 760, food service management. Thank you. Um, the Department of Agriculture's Office of Food and Nutrition Services Civil Rights Division announced uh, an update to the federally required processing policy, which expanded the non-discrimination statement. So this policy is being revised to reflect the changes to the non-discrimination statement. Any questions or comments? Next, we have rule 761, appeals of eligibility for free or reduced price benefits. The non-discrimination language is also in this, in this rule. So this is also being updated to reflect that revised non-discrimination language. Okay, moving on to G, policy 823, access to public records. We're bringing forward changes to the public records policy and um, rule to reflect the uh, accurate reflection of what constitutes a local public office for purposes of the public records law, as well as to reflect different uh, position names here in the district in the policy to provide better transparency to our stakeholders. Any questions or comments? I feel bad Dawn did so much work in facilitation and this is going so quick now. But, um, and the last one is the rule 823 access to public records. Same reason for bringing forward those changes as well. Any comments or questions? Okay, that wraps up the policy and governance. And so at the next, um, at the regular scheduled board meeting, we'll be looking at approving these. So just, I just wanna make sure I'm Clarification, with respect to the posting of the board meetings, are we okay to move forward with the posting in the three public places, the newspaper, and then putting that statement on the website? I don't think it requires board action, but I just wanna make sure that we're clear moving forward with that. Okay, we'll do that for the next board meeting then. Thank you.
um, that brings us to um, item six, agenda setting. Um, I don't have anything to offer other than to remind people to, that we are going to have some uh, special sessions coming up to um, vote on vote on um, hiring, basically, um, on personnel issues. Uh, just to kind of keep track of your calendar, keep up to date on on um, and the invitations you get to various uh, meetings so that we can take care of that business. Um, and also, uh, as you head home tonight, um, be really careful. Apparently there's quite, there's warnings about uh, trees down, flooded streets, and um, just uh, practice a lot of caution and care as you make your way home. Um, I can't think of anything else, Vicki, no, okay then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, it is it is really bad on the west side and there's power lines down and not not everything is necessarily that well marked yet. So I don't know about the east side, but if you're coming to the west side, definitely there's, you know, there's uprooted trees, there's down power lines. It's, it was no, um, it was no joke over here, although I'm not aware of any, I have not heard about any injuries. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, we've been in this building and so none of us have seen yet quite what it's gonna be like. So um, that's why I wanna just recommend everyone be super careful and take your time and practice caution. So anyway, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Brian moved. Oh, I'll, I'll second. <laughs> okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes aye. have it. We are adjourned. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920 448 2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible. <music>